All right, hello everyone and welcome to the spring 2022 forensic medicine orientation. So hopefully you are all here for the right thing. Let's see, there we go. All right, my slides were momentarily frozen. Hopefully you are all here for the, the right orientation, which is the forensic medicine program offered distance education through the Maple Center for Forensic Medicine. Uh, the Maple Center offers a lot of different forensic opportunities here at UF, so we'll just really quickly pop over to the Maple Center website, show you guys what that looks like, so you can find out some more information about all of our various online programs, the courses that are offered. We'll talk about that a little more in just a minute. I am Dr. Lyra Sutton. I'm your program director and uh, your student advisor through the duration of your time here with the Masters in Forensic Medicine program. So you can see my email address is listed below. Please make a note of that and reach out to me anytime you guys have questions, comments, concerns as you're working through your degree. I am always here to help. I'm going to be your main point of contact for academic advising along with our director of academic support who you'll hear from uh, shortly. So there's a lot of links that you're going to need to be familiar with and keep bookmarked as you're working through progress in your online degree. The first and most important link is Canvas. That's our learning management system where all of the courses in this program are offered. So you'll want to make sure you bookmark this link, elearning at ufl.edu. When you click on it, it'll take you to the general e-learning landing page. So you'll click this link, log into e-learning. It will have you log in using your Gator Link ID, and it will take you to a dashboard. Now your dashboards won't look quite like mine since I have all of the program courses on my dashboard, but you'll see the courses that you're enrolled in. You'll see a to-do list, and that tells you upcoming assignments. Right here, you'll see your course calendar, which is very important to check at the beginning of the semester and then consistently throughout the semester to make sure you're staying on top of all of your course deadlines. You also have this tab on the left and we'll talk about that more in a minute. So we'll come back to Canvas. Within each of your dashboards as enrolled students in the forensic medicine program, you should all have access to the program course shell. And that's a way that all actively enrolled students can communicate as one group. It looks something like this, and I'll take you over to that directly. So whether you're actively enrolled in a course or not, if you take a semester off, that's okay. You should still have access to this course shell. And what you're able to do is check some general announcements. And this is where I communicate with everyone all at once any program related announcements if there's anything going on with the, the COVID-19 pandemic that the university needs us to let you know uh, you can find all of that information here so you should all see the program shell on your dashboard if you don't send me an email and we'll make sure we get you added to that that's a course shell you will be enrolled in for your entire time with us in the program. So the semester after you graduate, you do get removed from the course shell, but that's something you'll have access to me, to all of your instructors, all of your teaching assistants, and all of the other currently enrolled students in the program. So it's also a great opportunity to reach out to your fellow students for networking and finding some opportunities to communicate in an online format. Now, Critical points for success. Communication is key when you're doing a distance education program because all of our classes, other than the lab classes, are offered asynchronously. That means we're not getting together at a scheduled time, live in person or live via Zoom. You're logging in in a way that meets your schedule in accordance with the posted deadlines and working through your courses. So making sure you're staying on top of all the communication that we send out to you, as well as that the university sends out to you is very important. As a University of Florida student, you have two separate inboxes and two separate emails that you need to make sure you're staying on top of. 
The first one is your Canvas inbox. So again, you access that through e-learning. So you log into Canvas, and you'll see here, you have this blue tab on the left side of your screen, and you'll see a button that says Inbox. You'll click on that, and that will take you to the Canvas Inbox system. Right up here on the top, you'll have an option to compose new message, and then you select the course you're emailing about. It's very, very important when you're emailing your instructor that you're contacting us through Canvas. A lot of our instructors teach multiple courses within the program, myself included. So we want to make sure when a student reaches out to us, we know exactly what course you're asking about, which section of that course you're enrolled in, so we can give you the most accurate information and not have to go back and forth several times and ask which course, which section. We can just jump straight into it. So make sure you're always checking your Canvas account and your Canvas inbox for communications, for announcements, and course-specific updates. The next one that you need to check is your general UF email, and that's associated with your Gator link. You access that by going to webmail.ufl.edu. And before you get the deer in the headlights look, all of the information in this presentation is going to be emailed out to you. So you can bookmark these links directly from this program. So just watch what we're doing right now and you can bookmark the links later. As a student, you'll have access to this one, the Gator Cloud student email. So you'll click on that. Again, you'll log in using your GatorLink UFID, which is something you've set up the same way you access Canvas and it pulls up a separate type of email account. That is where the University of Florida will correspond with you about all university related things. That's where our registration team will reach out to you with registration links for upcoming semesters. That's where our administration and academic support services team will reach out to you about registration holds, uh, graduation updates, degree audits, so make sure you're checking both of those email addresses on a regular basis. What you can do, and I highly recommend that you do this, is you can set up your Canvas inbox to automatically forward to your UF email inbox. So what will happen is you'll end up getting a notification. Let's see if I can find one. I get a lot of email. All right, maybe I don't have one in here quickly that you guys can see but it will notify you that it's coming from Canvas and that can prompt you to go ahead and log into your Canvas inbox and see what's going on. Do make sure that you check both inboxes because they are different and they do serve different purposes. All right, that's email. Another asset that you get within being a student at the University of Florida is the library system. There's a lot of students who will extend their graduation. They'll you know, stay enrolled in courses just because they like having access to the libraries. We have one of the largest library systems in the country for academic journals. Any academic journal you can think of, UF probably subscribes to for you, which means access to all of these academic journals, publications, e-versions of textbooks are all available to you for free. The way we recommend you access the library and the way we recommend you access anything associated with your coursework is using the UF VPN. That's the most secure way. And what that does is it tells your internet provider, I'm associated with the University of Florida. So you'll click on that. You'll follow all of the instructions for how to set it up. Right, so depending on if you're Windows, if you're Mac, anything like that, just follow those instructions and log into the VPN. If you have trouble with that, let's say you're on a work computer or your personal computer is out of commission and you're having to use a public library or something like that where you can't download software. You do then have the opportunity to access the library proxy server. It's not quite as reliable as the formal VPN, but it is an option, and that allows you to access the library system. That makes everything contained within our library system free to you as a student. 
So if you try to access a, a paper, a journal article, a book, anything like that, and it asks you to pay for it, chances are pretty good you're not properly logged into the VPN. So go back, log into this page, make sure your VPN is working, and that way you're able to access the library system. So familiarize yourself with that, with the proxy server, and that will take you here, right? So you're off campus access, and then you can use all of these same opportunities, just like you would if you're on campus. You log in with your data link, that's all you need to do. There's a great search feature within the library where you can search by journal, you can search by title, keyword, topic. So this is very helpful when you're conducting your research for all of your module assignments. Every program has written assignments associated with the modules, every course does. And you're going to need to do research to substantiate what you're writing in these assignments. So we want to make sure you're doing academic research. So that means journal articles that are peer reviewed and published. The UF library system is the best way to find those articles that you're going to need to use in your module assignments. The next thing you need to consider once you start the program is whether you're interested in pursuing a thesis or not. There's no right or wrong answer to this. It just depends on what your particular areas of interest are for the long term academic goals. If you think you're wanting to do a PhD after you finish your master's degree, the thesis route is probably the right way for you to go because it's kind of a mini PhD dissertation. It gives you the opportunity to get your feet wet in academic research and thesis writing. You work with a committee and you might say, man, I absolutely love this and I definitely want to do a PhD by the time you do your master's thesis. You say, yeah, this is definitely for me. Alternatively, you might work through your master's thesis and realize, oh, academic research and academic writing is not for me and I don't want to do a PhD. Either of those are very important things to discover about yourself and about your academic goals before you embark on the journey that is a PhD. Also, if you're interested in pursuing a career that involves laboratory research or grant research, so if you're interested in working with the National Institute of Justice or the National Science Foundation, those are research-based organizations. So having some thesis research under your belt when you go into those job applications might be helpful as well. If neither of those scenarios apply to you, either you're wanting to do a doctorate program or a research-based career path, then the non-thesis option is probably the best track for you. The benefit of the non-thesis track is all students in the non-thesis track get to take a minimum of four additional elective classes outside of their core curriculum, which gives them an opportunity to delve into a lot of different subspecialties within the forensic sciences and within forensic medicine. This also includes some of our lab classes. So if you're not sure which route is right for you, or if you want some more information about what's involved in a thesis versus a non-thesis track, we have a whole section on our website that talks about these options. And it also gives you some specifics of what's actually involved and what's required of both thesis and non thesis students. So if you're on the fence, check this out kind of see the table of what's required for each option. And you can always reach out to me for more information if you're not sure which way you want to go, we can talk it through and i'm always happy to guide you. We're very excited within the forensic medicine program to be able to offer the opportunity for in person hands on lab classes. Now these classes are structured very differently than the online courses that you take throughout the remainder of your degree. The online courses are 15 semesters for fall and spring or excuse me 15 week semesters for fall and spring and 13 week semesters during the summer where you're working through one module roughly one module a week plus a midterm plus a final. The lab classes are different because they are five days at a time. You come to Florida either Gainesville or one of our lab classes is offered in Daytona Beach. So you come to Florida for five days it's Monday through Friday 8 to 5 pm they're very long they're very intense days. But at the end of those five days you've earned academic lab credit you've earned three credit hours. 
They are fully eligible for federal financial aid, which is great, so that you are able to come to campus, work with us hands-on, one-on-one, and be able to apply the techniques that you're learning in your online classes in a more practical and tactile way. The classes that we have, lab classes for this semester, are the principles of crime scene investigation lab and the principles of blood stain pattern analysis lab. We also offer the uh, blood stain pattern analysis course online, and we do highly recommend students take that online version of the course either first or concurrently with the lab class just to make sure they have a strong understanding in the theory. For the principles of crime scene investigation, that's a core class that you take online. All students in the program take that class. And the lab class, of course, is an optional elective. I highly recommend that lab class, particularly to every student in this program, if you can take it, because it's a very broad overview of almost every discipline you might interact with in forensic medicine. You learn a little bit about a lot of things, everything from blood stain pattern analysis, photography, anthropology, fingerprints, alternate light sources, all of that material is covered within this week. And it gives you the opportunity to say, hey, I really like this one topic. This other one, maybe I'm not so keen on. But because so much is covered within that week, it gives you a really good overview of a lot of topics and it's extremely hands-on. In the summer, we offer the Forensic Photography Lab and the Forensic Entomology Lab. And then in the fall, we offer the Artifacts and Decomposition Lab, which is clandestine grave detection and excavation and teaching you how to estimate the postmortem interval. So they're all very hands-on, you know, come to campus, wear clothes, you're okay getting dirty in because it's, it's extremely hands-on, it's extremely interactive, but it's also a lot of fun. So if, you're, if you have the opportunity to participate in one of these lab classes, I highly recommend it. It's a great experience for our students and we're very excited to be able to meet you in person and work with you and interact in that way. If none of those lab classes appeal to you or the other electives that we offer within the forensic medicine program, don't fear, you still have more options. I'll take you back to that Maple Center website that we've seen before. So here's our program. You guys should all be familiar with the forensic medicine website, but we also have a couple of other forensic related programs within the Maple Center. So you can click into those programs. Let's say, for example, the Veterinary Forensic Science Program. Any of the courses offered within the Maple Center program, so any course you can access through the Maple Center website, you can take as an elective for the Forensic Medicine program. All you need to do, let's say you really want to take cybercrime and wildlife investigations. That's just something that really interests you. Send me an email, tell me I'm in the forensic medicine program and I'm interested in this class. We can then work together to make sure that elective credit applies to your forensic medicine degree. So lots of opportunities for you. You also have the opportunity to enroll in dual degree programs across any of our Maple Center programs. So if that appeals to you, if you want to do vet forensics and forensic medicine or wildlife forensics and forensic medicine, you have that opportunity to do that as well. So just email us, let us know what works for you, and we'll do our best to find a way to make it work. You are a student at the University of Florida, even though you're a distance education student. So just because you're not necessarily on campus doesn't mean you're not still held to the same responsibilities and policies of any other student at UF. That means the graduate student handbook. So you follow this link, and that takes you to the full copy of the UF Graduate Student Handbook. That's all of the UF policies, grading, graduation planning, the requirements for graduation, and very importantly, the UF Honor Code. That talks about expectations of plagiarism, expectations of academic honesty, expectations of how you interact with your student, fellow students, your peers, your professors, faculty and staff within the university, and it also specifies stipulations if you violate any of those policies. So make sure you read it, make sure you're aware of those policies, 
that way you're best able to abide by those policies and have a very successful journey through your time with us. In that same vein, you are a student at UF, so you get access to all the same benefits and perks of any other UF student. You can get a student ID card, and we definitely recommend students do that because you can get your student discounts at different stores. You can get access to special technology licensing and discounts, and you can do all of that through the mail. You can upload a passport style photo to them and they will mail you your student ID card. So you can have a UF student ID and you don't have to come to campus to get it. The UF Help Desk is phenomenal. It is one of the best technology resources for distance education students and, and even for on-campus students. It is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. If the University of Florida is open, there is someone answering the phone at the UF Help Desk. So be familiar with this website. It's pretty simple, helpdesk.ufl.edu. There's the website, you can email them and you can live chat. So if you're not the kind of person that wants to talk on the phone, you can live chat. If it's kind of a general question and it's not urgent, you can send them an email. The really important point I want to drive home about the help desk is if you're having technological issues with Canvas, let's say you can't access your courses or you get locked out of Respondus browser, call the help desk and get issued a ticket number. That's something that you need to then provide to us so we can have a record of it if we need to reopen your exams, if we need to troubleshoot anything. So if you run into tech issues, call the help desk and get a ticket number and that helps us streamline everything we need to do to get you back up and running. There's also a lot of other free resources and I won't spend time talking about those since you will get a copy of this presentation. You can click through all of these links. There's LinkedIn Learning, you get free and discounted access to types of software. That includes the Gator Cloud, which is one terabyte of free online cloud storage you don't have to pay for, so that's pretty great. Um, check it out, see what sort of free options are available to you. As an online student, most of you are probably going to be doing your classes from home. So I have my cat Quincy, named after the old TV show, Quincy Medical Examiner, to demonstrate the importance of a dedicated workspace. I know it's tempting when you're taking an online class to prop up with your laptop in bed and a nice cup of tea and want to do your classes that way. But sometimes that leads to, oh, I'm gonna check Facebook, I'm gonna turn on the TV. So in order to be most successful in your academic online learning journey, we recommend you set a schedule and stick to it. Pick a place, pick a time, and do your work in that same place, in that same space, in that same time consistently. It's going to help you establish good study habits. There's also another website. UF has a website for everything that gives you some tips and tricks for the, the best ways to be successful as an online student. So do what Quincy does, have a desk, have a dedicated study space that isn't necessarily your bed or your couch, and you'll probably be pretty successful. I'm going to turn it over to a very important person that you're going to be getting a lot of emails from and working very closely with through the duration of your degree, our Director of Academic Support Service, Narsi Ramachandran. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me loud and clear? Raise your thumb or give me a hands up. Thank you. Thank you all for making time and joining us on this exciting day to get y'all oriented with, the new, uh, with your University of Florida Forensic Medicine concentration, which is fully online, but it also has a hybrid mode where you can come to campus and visit us and uh, share some great time and your learning opportunities. A couple of things I think majority of you are now successfully registered. Yeah. We had more than 1,300 students uh, that we had to process register, I mean, 1,300 registration requests, I would say, because we have more than 600 or 700 students between our four programs. So these are uh, the initial few weeks of the term are always busy because we moved through end of term start of new term, get caught up with critical deadlines that the university has mandated, because that is when students are graduating, coming for commencement centers, et cetera. 
So we try to kind of balance all those and prioritize things accordingly. By now, you should all be registered for your class. If you had any issues, you would have received an email from us saying you have A, B, or C an issue, and you have to go to one doc, you have to rectify that. It could be a training that is required by UF or a hold, which gets put every semester. So please, at least two months before the start of a new term, go to one doc, you have to see if you have any holds. Um, these first few weeks, so January 11th, I would say days, not weeks, um, is called as the add drop period during which you would be able to drop a course without any penalty based on the coursework that is required, how your work life situation is, even that out and see how it is going to work. A general rule of thumb is if you're a graduate student and you're taking a three credit class, you need to invest nine hours of the time per week. So plan for your coursework and your work life balance based on that guideline. And if you're a full-time working professional and you're not seeking federal financial aid, start with one class, that's okay. And then you get an idea because online learning is very different when compared to going to an in-person class or what you may have done during the undergraduate years. You did five classes, six classes, you survive, but not in a graduate program. It's a lot more different. Um, so please look that over, look at your syllabus, talk to your instructors real between this period and get a good assessment of what you should be in and feel free to drop any class if you're not gonna be able to manage before January 11th, 11.59 p.m. Eastern daylight saving time. Hopefully one day we can just say Eastern time. <laughs> Um, some of you may have started or are planning to start in the non-degree track. These are students who may have just wanted to try to get their feet wet, they mean being out of uh, education or uh, graduate education, per se, for several years and want to get a feel of it, or for other reasons to improve their GPA, et cetera, to qualify for the master's program. Some of you may have started in that track. So whenever you're doing a non-degree track, we do expect that you perform with a good grade. It doesn't matter if pretty much all programs, we want you to make a B or a higher grade because you need to maintain a 3.0 GPA when you're graduating. But if you plan to start out in the non-degree track, it is not a degree seeking track. You need to apply to the master's degree after earning three, six, nine credits, depending on uh, what we recommend. We do not recommend going more than the nine credits because it becomes a little bit of a challenge to transfer those. But once you get accepted to the master's program, we will submit the transfer of those credits as long as it meets the criteria of B and higher and it has to be done within seven years. Um, we also have some students who do the graduate certificate program or add a graduate certificate program. So we have students who are doing the master's in forensic medicine, but would like to add a concentration like a graduate certificate in the wildlife forensics or the veterinary forensics. You could do that. All you need to do is submit your application and that way you get those processed in a timely fashion and they all tie in together when you're getting ready to graduate. Uh, the other good resource for many of you, uh, if you have any form of learning disability, please engage with the disability resource office, and you will have to do that every semester. And there is an intake form, and then you would work with a counselor there who would go through what would the best recommendation be for you, and they would generate a form that would be submitted, and you would need to submit that accommodation letter to your professors every semester. And that way, if you need, say, times two for taking an exam or something, those settings can be made for you and you have that extra time and work through your course in a timely fashion. There are two types of withdrawal, and uh, we normally recommend that uh, you reach out to our office and your professors first to keep them appraised of what is happening. Medical withdrawal is something that is beyond your control and something has come up and you have to cope with it. We do understand life happens, but they are very specific requirements that you meet. You need to fill out the medical reimbursement uh, 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 petition. 
which involves the statement from you and also your healthcare provider. You need to provide the letter from your doctor who's providing care for you. And the instructor and our department also gets notified on our part that we do not get to see all those uh, doctor letters or anything else that you may have submitted because they all have a compliance issues. So we just submit our part, but anything else that is required by the DSO's office would come to you. So please take the time to fill it out diligently and make sure everything is completed because if you do not submit them, then there could be financial penalties and also uh, uh, punitive grades like an E, which is a failing grade, and drop your GPA down, which would require you to take additional coursework. And if you're seeking FAFSA and other things, you have to generate additional letters of support and go through a lot more hoops to get to continue the program. The other uh, drop is a non punitive regular withdrawal, which could be done towards uh, till I would say the last. Uh, six weeks of the program or something like that. That is, if you're not able to really do well and you have real challenges keeping up with the coursework and um, uh, you may end up with a failing grade or something, please talk to your instructor. We do not want you to wait till the very last minute. The first three weeks is where you could really make that determination because we're all graduate level students and professionals who can see what is the commitment required? If something is too much, you should be able to speak out and say, I'm not able to handle this and uh, work for a remedy at that point as opposed to waiting till the end hour. So please be um, respectful of the university deadlines, your professor's commitment and the additional work that goes into making sure you're successful. Let us all take the responsibility to work together to ensure that you all complete these programs successfully. Uh, as I mentioned, you need to complete the core courses as we have listed on the program website. They may be a little bit of mismatch in the count. Do not worry about it saying 37 credits or 38 credits, depending on where you are and what courses you are taking. The important thing is you need to complete at least 37 credits and all the core courses that is required they have to be completed. You can take as many electives as you want. There is no restriction on that, but just make sure that you're completing the core courses. And during the final graduating term, make sure you're at least signed up for three credits. That way, that is a requirement from the graduate school, technically. And they also have a link to the graduate school's handbook, graduate student handbook, which is on the next slide. I'll show that to you. Please take some time to read through that. And a very important point that I want you to specifically uh, pay attention to is the honor code. Any student submitting graduate uh, uh, papers or homework or research has to be original papers. And any paper that reaches the 25% uh, threshold for originality report is flagged by the Turnitin system. And those would go through extra scrutiny and in certain cases that we may even have to refer these cases to the honor code and uh, uh, honor court, which is a separate body that looks into these kind of issues. So we do not want to get into that situation. So we just want you all to be taking the time and pride and being a graduate student to submit original, original work for your uh, paper. The student portal is one.uf.edu. I would highly encourage you to go there, visit that site, get comfortable with that. That is where you would see your unofficial transcripts, your official polls, any training that you would be required to do, or uh, if you had some transcripts that were pending, all those holes that are show up on the right-hand side every semester. So at least two months prior, you would go there and uh, look that up. And that is also the place where you would go to submit your graduation application and you get to the final term and pay your fees every semester. Think. And now we have Nutmeg. Did I get that right? <laughs> uh, financial aid. Um, so if some of you are seeking federal financial aid, uh, Nutmeg is working through his uh, financial aid paperwork diligently. Uh, there's certain criteria that you have to meet. That is, uh, summer, I think you have to take at least five credits, but fall and spring, it is six credits or two classes. 
but as a rule of thumb, it is easier to remember two classes of fees per semester to be eligible for federal financial aid. But if you're working full time and not seeking federal financial aid, then that's okay. You can start with one class or depending on how you feel, you can do two classes too. That's not an issue. But if you're working full time and want the federal financial aid, you need to take at least two classes per term. And also stick to those guidelines for maintaining a B or higher grade or the financial aid office would uh, ding you with uh, additional paperwork if you have to submit and uh, enter counseling with uh, me and Dr. Sutton and we fill out the other paperwork and go through. So that's primarily it. And we also have a dedicated financial aid specialist who works with our program and their contact information is on our website as well. And email is the best way to get to them. All right. So that brings yeah. us to the end where we have Winchester. Very excited to tell you, contact us. You can find all the information, important links and contact information through our main program website, forensicmedicine.med.ufl.edu. Our contact phone number, that takes you to our administrative offices. Now, as Narcy mentioned, email is typically the best way to contact us. Since most of us have emails going straight to our phone, that's the fastest way to reach us. If you want to talk to somebody, you can call that number, but we always recommend you email us so we have a written record that we can associate with your student account. For general advising and registration questions, you can use our forensics at ahc.ufl.edu address. For program questions, academic advising, thesis versus non-thesis, lab classes, and basically anything else under the sun, reach out to me. That's Lyra Sutton at ufl.edu. And for general questions about the program, including admissions and semester by semester registration, you'll reach out to our onboarding team, which is masters at dce.ufl.edu. Make sure you save the forensics and the master's email addresses to your address book, because you'll be getting a lot of correspondence from both of those addresses throughout your degree program. That will include registration links, information about clearing holds at the end of the semester, degree audits, and graduation information. So bookmark those addresses, make sure you add them so they don't accidentally get caught up in your spam filters, and communicate, 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 and you'll have a very successful progress through your degree here with us in forensic medicine. If you don't already, follow us on Facebook. We post course updates, program updates, Forensic Fact Friday, fun little videos. Um, so if you like social media, that's your thing, follow us on Facebook. But otherwise, that is it. Uh, I'll turn it over, I'll stop screen sharing, and that will give you guys the ability to unmute your microphones and ask questions. You're welcome to turn your video on, you're welcome to uh, talk about your questions or put them in the chat box if you have questions as well. So let's see, I'll stop screen sharing and uh, does anyone have any questions? No, all right. I do. Oh, um, hello, oh, Rebecca. Hi. <laughs> um, so in terms of the lab classes, um, the only class that we need to take the regular online class with the lab is the blood stain pattern, the serology class? So we typically recommend for any of our lab classes that you take the online version either first or simultaneously. The reason okay. for that is these lab classes are really intense. They're very hands-on and we just kind of throw you straight from the frying pan into the fire. So if you've had a strong foundation in that topic, through taking the online class first, or at least working through most of it, the lab classes are usually offered either midway or towards the end of the semester. So if you take the online class at the same time, you've gotten some foundation information first. 
if let's say you're already working in forensic medicine, you're already working as a crime scene investigator, you're already working as a death investigator, you're already working in a medical examiner's office, and you say, hey, I, I've got kind of the foundation already, and I want to come take the lab, we can override that requirement for you, but it's on a case by case basis. So we typically do want to see you take the online course first, and then the lab class, or if it just works out with your schedule, do mm -hmm. take them at the same time, but we don't ever want to see students only taking the lab class without okay. also taking the online version at, as well. So, and that also goes for the veterinary lab classes as well, correct? Uh, Dr. Bird, that's going to be a question for you. I, I didn't, I don't think you guys have veterinary labs yet. We do not, but like I say, um, outside of the core courses, if they take those classes, um, they can be counted as electives in that med. Okay. Yeah, so if you take any of, if you want to either do the graduate certificate in veterinary forensics, or if you want to dual enroll and earn two master's degrees at the same time, those are electives. So right now, vet forensics doesn't have separate lab classes. Uh, but if you want to take any of the electives in the vet forensics program, you can take those electives at any time throughout your degree. You don't have to do all of the core requirements first. Yeah, Does that make sense? Is, yeah, yeah, some of the labs, we're not going to have separate. I mean, like for forensic photography, I mean, the principles are the same. So it doesn't make any sense for us to go through and create- Or the crime scene well. too, or the blood pattern. I, I, so let me, let me clarify. I think what he means is there's not going to be a separate veterinary forensic lab separate from the photography lab or the crime scene lab. Yeah, I mean, the principles are the same. So it makes no sense for us to go through and create a separate class for that. So for the students who are interested in learning the principles of forensic photography, you just take it in the forensic medicine program and it counts as elective in vet forensics. So I see uh, Javier, am I saying that right? I think you were in one of our other orientation sessions. So I, you, I think, are a dual enrolled student. So this would apply um, to your case where you could take the lab classes that are offered in forensic medicine, but they can apply as electives to multiple degree tracks. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> Does anyone have any other questions? And Rebecca, if you're still, if you're a little confused about that, or you want to talk about your course plan and your progress more specifically, just send me an email. We can set up an advising appointment and, and go through exactly how you want everything structured and make sure it works for you and also fits the degree requirements. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right. Well, I guess that means we did our jobs effectively going over everything. Uh, I know it's a lot of information we throw at you in a very short period of time. So you will be emailed a copy of this recorded session, as well as a PDF of the PowerPoint with all of those active hyperlinks. So you can follow the links, you can bookmark them. My email address is listed several places in this presentation, several places on the website, and several places in Canvas. So never hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions, if you're confused about anything, if you want to talk about the merits of thesis versus non-thesis, the specifics of a lab class, general forensic guidance for long-term career options. Whatever helps you is what we're here to do. So never ever hesitate to reach out and let us know. If you don't let us know you need help, we can't help you. So don't ever feel like you're gonna bother us. We're always happy to help. So without any other questions, oh, we do have one more. Lacey wants to know who would we contact for financial aid questions? Narcy, do you wanna handle that one? Yeah, the contact person is listed on our website. Is the SFA email address that you see. Uh, do you have the slide open for our website? Uh, I, I don't, but I can pull it up really quickly. Let me just jump right back to that. All right. So, so if you go me... to the um, student uh, resources, I believe, under financial aid, you will see the contact person. So if you go here, we've got College of mm -hmm. Medicine Financial Aid. And this and is... A little down, there it is. 
tickets and you just email directly and that's specific to our College of Medicine programs. And that is linked right here. It's this bottom bullet. So if you click on that, it takes you to this website and that's your directed contact person for this program. All right, any other last minute questions? All right, well, thank you guys so much for taking the time and joining us in today's orientation session. I look forward to working with all of you throughout your forensic medicine journey. And I hope you guys have a fantastic semester. Stay safe. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye.